In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we're going through the threefold mission of Christ, the threefold office of Christ, I guess is a more appropriate way of saying that, of him being a priest, prophet, and king, and how we share in his threefold office and are given a unique mission because of that by virtue of our baptism. And we've already covered kingship, so now let's go into what it means to be a prophet and what it means to share in Christ's prophethood. I think I'm making that word up, but I don't care. We're going to go forward with it. So, Catechism of the Catholic Church. Woo! Paragraph 785. The holy people of God shares also in Christ's prophetic office, above all in the supernatural sense of faith that belongs to the whole people, lay and clergy, when it unfailingly adheres to this faith, once for all delivered to the saints, and when it deepens its understanding and becomes Christ's witness in the midst of this world. That's pretty, it's hard to top the catechism with how great that is. Um, so if you look at the, in the kingship one, we kind of looked at the nature of a king and the various natures of, if you look at the prophets in the scripture, and their various actions and, and proclamations and the like, and see what they do. You basically find that they are individuals who have been gifted the truth from our Lord, that in humility of our Lord receive it, and in love of our Lord live in it. And then it's not enough that they just receive the truth from he who is truth. They go out and they proclaim that truth to the world so that the world may receive the beauty of the gift that they have received, God's truth and love. So you look at, um, let's look at a few prophets. Look at the prophet Nathan, who uh, advised King David. He would be that, that proclamation, that voice, that, that mouthpiece, as if you will, um, of our Lord's truth and proclamations to King David during his reign. He also, when King David fell into grave sin, and King David committed adultery and had um, the uh, committed the murder of the of the husband, um, and tried to cover it all up and all that fun stuff, did just horrendous acts. Um, it was the prophet Nathan that spoke, given by God, spoke the truth to King David of, "Hey, your sins have been found out, and injustice punishments coming for you." and you need to repent. And upon hearing that, King David repents. Um, it's a quick side tangent. That's one of the, the reasons why King David is so revered, because he does a lot of horrific stuff. There's quite a few saints, actually, that have done not so great things in their lives. Um, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Augustine, just name a few. Um, no offense, guys. Please, please don't hold against me. Um, heck, I'm myself. Um, but one of the things that King David is so great about is that when he sins... And when he, his sins are made known or, or recognized or the humility kicks back in, the, the regret kicks back in, his contrition and his penance and his amendment of life is astounding. He goes to extreme lengths of humility and love and penance and admonishment for the love of God to make up for what he has done wrong. So part of what is revered about David is that conversion of hearts after he has sinned so thoroughly grave as he does. Quick tangent. Anyway, back to the prophet. So, prophet Nathan reveals this truth, proclaims this truth to the king, so that the king may receive the truth and then may amend his life. The prophet Elijah, who is the uh, representative of the totality of the prophets, as seen at the Transfiguration, when you have uh, Moses and Elijah, the, the law and the prophets, uh, with, with our Lord. He goes up to... The Israelite people who have basically just thrown themselves after David, thrown themselves into lot with um, the worship of Baal, 
a uh, pagan god and, and idols, and that, according to Elijah, he is the lone voice of God, and there are something like 450 priests and prophets of Baal that have just been promulgating the worship of this heretical uh, deity amongst the people, and the people have been following suit. They've been giving all of their praise and their worship and their alms and thanksgiving and sacrifices to Baal. And at one point, Elijah challenges them all and does the whole, the famous uh, prayer off, I like to say, or worship off or, or sacrifice off, where uh, he builds an altar, the bull, priests build an altar, all 450 of them. Um, they both prepare an oxen for sacrifice. They, they prepare the kindling, but they're not allowed, neither of them, nobody is allowed to set fire to the sacrifice. They are to call upon their God, respectively, and whoever uh, God ignites from the heavens that, that sacrifice is the one true God. And the prophets of Baal, the priests of Baal, spend I think it, it says all the way till mid-afternoon, um, in which they just cry to the heavens. <laughs> Elijah kind of mocks him for it, but it cries to the heavens and nothing. And then Elijah has the uh, people poured huge jugs of water three times over the offering, over the wood for kindling. He built a trench around it. It says that the water filled the trench and overflowed. This thing is soaked and then calls the Lord and the Lord strikes the altar so summarily that the whole thing just nights and he is able to prove hey uh my god our god one true god balls false um john the baptist proclaims the coming of our lord jesus christ he's the prophet in the wilderness the voice in the wilderness of the truth make way the the make ready the way of the lord and calls the people to conversion so prophets are individuals who have been tasked by god to receive his truth because he is truth to receive his truth receive it in humility and love and then they are tasked after receiving that truth to go out into the world and proclaim the truth to the world so that the world might, in receiving that truth, convert. That they may turn away from sin and go back to God. And that's what you see with David, with Elijah, with John the Baptist. None of them are going like, hey, God sees what you've done wrong and he hates you and he's done with you. And he is just like, I'm never speaking to you guys again. All of them are... God has seen what you've done wrong, and he wants you to stop, and there will be a just repayment, a just penance for that. I mean, you break a window, you got to pay for the window. So there will be justice, but he wants you back. He loves you. He wants you to return to a virtuous, holy way of living. He wants you to turn away from your sinful living, come back. And often, being a prophet is met with a lot of danger and uh, threats to your life. Elijah, after the whole ball incident, he flees because they want to kill him. Uh, it may also happen, have something to do with the fact that, aside from just the sheer humiliation of it, that the, the priests are um, exercised and slain because of it, uh, because of what they're leaving astray. But still, they, they want him dead. And so he's like, oh, gotta go. Um, so as to not have his life imprudently slain. Uh, John the Baptist is beheaded for it uh, by Herod's wife that he took from his brother. Um, so there, there is a risk, there's an inherent danger to proclaiming the truth to a people that are so thoroughly attached to their sinful ways. Jesus, as he is the fulfillment of all things, being God is truth. And then in his office of prophetic office, proclaims the one truth. He is who is truth. He is truth and he proclaims truth to the world that the world may receive him, and in coming to receive him and know him, may love him, and may amend their lives, and turn away from sin, and live fully in that love. We who are baptized have a share in his prophetic, prophetic office, his prophethood, which means we, like the prophets, in humility and love of our Lord, are to receive the truth given to us by God. That's the, the doctrines of the church the faith of the church, the moral teachings of the church. We are to receive what God reveals to us and gives to us that he has made the, the, the church and the magisterium be stewards of. And we are, for love of our Lord and in humility, to strive to know our Lord, the, who is truth, better and better and better and better. We are to immerse ourselves in the truth that is God. And then, so that, I mean, so that means prayer, that means study, that means all of these great things. And then we're not supposed to hoard it or keep it secret. We are through our thoughts, our words, our actions, our prayers. We are to go out into the world and bring the truth of God to them. 
that they may receive the truth and in receiving it, amend their lives, have a conversion of hearts through God's grace and come to know and love our Lord. It, it, we're messengers, basically. We are, we are in the best message that God loves us and wants us to love him for eternity. So to be a prophet is living a life so deeply rooted in the truth of God, the doctrines, the faith, the morals, the supreme truth that God loves us and we are made in the image of that love, that we as prophets are so deeply rooted in that truth, we never leave it. And we just continue to immerse ourselves deeper and deeper into it. And then as prophets, we are to bring that truth out to the world or as sharers of the one true prophet, Jesus. We are to bring that truth out to the world so that the world has the chance to do the same. And sometimes that's a mere correction because, again, David was a, is a beloved king of, of God. He loves David deeply. And so David has the actual humility of, okay, I need to come back. So sometimes it's just a mere correction of, hey, man, you've, you've kind of fallen off the path here. Come back. Sometimes it's a, they need to hear this. This is going to be uh, hazardous for you. People are going to reject you. They're going to um, obstruct you. They're, there's going to be an op you're going to be met with opposition, but the world needs to know the truth. And so it's having the courage, like John the Baptist, to go in the face of, or Elisha, to go in the face of that opposition and be like, guys, you need to know this is what's up. And sometimes it's just love. I mean, geez, I mean, it's all love. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes it's just helping those in your life who maybe aren't so deeply rooted in sin, but helping them to know and love God even better. This is godparents. Godparents do this for their godchildren. They are to be witnesses of the truth for their godchildren so that the godchildren, in seeing the example of their godparents and then having them, uh, the godparents come to them and help them, may grow in love in the truth. Jesus does this for the apostles. I mean, the, I know they'll abandon him, save John, and Judas betrays him, but he is routinely in the three years that he's with them, proclaiming the truth to them, explaining the truth to them, teaching them in the truth so that they may be able to do the same. And, you know, Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire. It's not like the apostles are ball worshippers. It's not like the apostles are um, some great maniacal, malevolent, evil force or entity or whatever. And yet God still teaches them and gives them the gift of the truth so that they may live in it, rest in it, deepen in it, and then be that for others. So to share in Jesus's prophetic office is to so lovingly love God, who is truth, that in great humility and love, we receive him who is truth, and we strive to have a greater understanding and a richer knowledge and appreciation for the truth of God, through the doctrines, through the teachings, through the moral teachings, the faith, all of it. And then in love of God and neighbor, seem to bring that out to our neighbor. That's what we get to share, and that's one of our missions, one of our um, ordinances in, in, gifted to us in baptism. Yeah, so I hope you guys have a blessed day, a graceful day. I hope you are able to see all the ways in which God has graced you and blessed you throughout your day, including those, those hardships, those opportunities for grace and love and to grow and practice in grace and love. And uh, yeah, I hope that it's, it's a blessed one and it continues to be a blessed one and that every opportunity is a means for that blessing, for that love to grow. Have a wonderful day. Have a blessed day. And uh, take care. See you next time.